Hello everyone, sitting next to me is my wife Lisbeth and here we are comparing the sound spectra of our voices. Even though we're trying to sing the same note, our voices sound quite different and I was curious if one could easily see the difference in an audio spectrum. For this experiment I used a free app from the Google Play Store called Spectroid. And here you see the spectra of our voices displaying the frequency scale on the horizontal axis and the amplitude as a lighter color. And as you can see, there are indeed differences between the audio spectra, especially here in the region of the overtones. And it's exactly these differences that allow for discriminating between voices, not only for a smartphone, but also for a human. For humans, distinguishing between different voices comes sort of naturally. We also use spectral analysis to do this and in fact we have a very advanced piece of hardware in our ear called the cochlea. It contains a thin membrane in a sort of spiral shaped void which is connected to a large number of hearing nerves. Each frequency it picks up is transmitted over a separate nerve to the brain. So the complex sound waves reaching our ears are first translated to frequency spectra and in a sense our brains are not processing the audio signals directly, but the audio spectra of the signals. But as you've seen with the smartphone, the conversion of an audio signal to a frequency spectrum can also be done in software. And in the case of the smartphone, an algorithm called Fast Fourier Transform is used, which is a numerical implementation of the Fourier Transform invented by Joseph Fourier in the late 18th century. Now, because the theory of Fourier transforms is actually pretty advanced, we will not take a deep dive into it. Instead, I'll just do a bit of shallow paddling for a few minutes. As an example, let's consider a signal which varies in time. And we know that this signal contains several different frequencies. Now, to find out if a specific frequency is in the signal, we can multiply the signal with the frequency under test. And by multiplication, I mean value by value in each of the curves. Now, the result of this multiplication is, for example, this curve. The next thing we can do is take the resulting curve and integrate all the values over time. So basically, this process involves adding up all the values in the curve. So this sum is equivalent to all the positive areas shown in green minus the sum of the negative areas shown in red. And this process results in a sort of net value, shown here as the size of this arrow. The thing is, if the frequency under examination is not present in the signal, the sum will generally be small, because the positive and negative values will sort of cancel each other out over time. However, if we do the same thing for a frequency which actually is present in the signal, the integration will yield a much larger net value. And by repeating this multiplication and integration process for a large number of frequencies, we can construct a frequency spectrum. And if you look at the spectrum here, you'll see that the signal is comprised of mainly three different frequencies. So this is the basic idea behind the Fourier transform. And with this in the back of our minds, I can very quickly illustrate how this process is described by the actual formula of the Fourier transform. The spectrum as a function of the frequency is equal to the signal as a function of time times the sinusoidal function with frequency f. And this multiplication is integrated over time. So that is the process that I've just illustrated and basically the essence of the Fourier transform. But of course, it's not the full story. The main simplification I made in my example is that I used a very simple sinusoidal function instead of the complex harmonic function presented here. And the key difference is that in the full formula, the resulting values of the transform are complex numbers. And the resulting function does not only contain a simple amplitude value for each frequency, but also information about the phase for each frequency. And with phase I refer to the relative starting point of each wave. And this is because not all frequencies in a signal have to exactly be in phase or start at the same point in time. 
But the reason why I ignored phase in the previous explanation is that in the optical Fourier transforms in this video, we do not observe phase directly. But if you want to understand Fourier, it's good to realize that the result of a transformation contains both amplitude and phase information. And for those of you who want to dive a bit deeper, uh, I will place a few links in the description. One of the beautiful aspects of the Fourier transform is that the process can also be reversed. So if we have the result of the Fourier transform, we can reproduce the original signal by just adding up all the different frequencies, considering their amplitudes and phase values, and then regenerate the original signal from the spectral data by just adding up all these waves. And this process is called an inverse Fourier transform. The principle of Fourier transforms has very wide applications in signal processing and can, for example, also be used to calculate frequency spectra in visual information, like in images. And in this case, we consider spatial signal variations instead of temporal variations. Here you see an image that contains a grayscaled wave pattern that has a variable spatial frequency along the horizontal direction. And the signal here is actually present in the grayscales of the pixels. So lighter values in the image represent high signal values and dark pixels represent low values, as is illustrated in this 3D plot of the same image. But because an image is generally two-dimensional, we also need a 2D spectrum to represent the result of the transform. If we apply a Fourier transform on this image, we get the following plot, a thin symmetric bright line along the x-axis. And it represents all the frequencies present in the image in the x-direction, ranging from zero frequency, which is always in the center of this type of plot, to higher frequencies displayed further away from the center. And when we've reached the maximum frequency present in the original image, the spectral signal suddenly goes to zero, because there are no higher frequencies in the image. By the way, because of how they're calculated, these plots are always symmetrical with respect to the center of the image. When moving along the y-axis in the Fourier transform, we see that only one single frequency is present, which is zero, so also in the center of the plot in the y-direction. And this is because in the original image there are no intensity variations present when moving along lines parallel to the y-axis. Fourier transforms can be applied on basically any image. And for humans, studying the Fourier transform is generally not very interesting. But for a computer that's a different story. So what a computer can do is calculate the Fourier transform of the image and then discard all the higher frequency information, so the outside regions of the Fourier transform, and then do an inverse transform on the reduced data. And as you can see, this results in a blurred version of the image. Now the reason for this is that all the high frequencies required to reproduce the sharp edges have been removed from the spectral information. But we can also discard the lower frequencies by blackening out the center of the Fourier transform. And in this case, an inverse transform only shows the sharp outlines in the image that require the high frequencies to display. Fourier transforms can also be used for pattern recognition. So let's say we have this image containing the letter A and we calculate the Fourier transform. If we place the A in different locations inside the image, the amplitudes of the Fourier transform will show exactly the same pattern, no matter where the A is located in the image. And in addition, if we take an image with multiple characters, for example an A and a B, a computer would still be able to tell instantly that there is an A in the image by just looking for the presence of specific frequencies in the 2D spectrum. Okay, now let's look at how we can do Fourier transforms using optics. And we will do this by using the optical equivalent of the cochlea, which is a plane lens actually. For a confocal lens, the plane at the focal distance of the lens is called the Fourier plane. And for good reasons, as I will show in a minute. So let's say we start out with a uniform beam of light. Basically, a uniform beam contains just one spatial frequency, which is zero, because there are no intensity variations in the beam. 
and in this case all the light is focused into one central spot in the Fourier plane. Next we place a mask in the beam containing transparent and non-transparent areas. So we modulate the intensity of the beam, introducing spatial frequencies other than zero. However, the mask will not only introduce intensity variations in the beam, but the edges in the pattern will also diffract the light in different directions. And this changes the angle of a fraction of the light and steers it away from the central point. And the higher the spatial frequencies in the pattern, the stronger the light is projected away from the central point in the Fourier plane. Now it's not trivial to see why the process of diffraction of light would yield exactly the same result as a Fourier transformation in the Fourier plane. But if I had to explain it in just one sentence, the mathematics describing Fresnel diffraction phenomena is very similar to that of the Fourier transformation. Now of course we want to observe how this works in practice, but it turns out that it's quite hard to demonstrate the effect when you use patterns that are relatively large compared to the wavelength of light. And in that case the total amount of light diffracted by the edges will be very small compared to the amount that is passing sort of straight through your mask. So, in the case of large patterns, there will be just one very bright spot in the center of the Fourier plane and maybe, if you're lucky, a few very dim patterns on the outside. However, if we use very small patterns, it becomes very easy to display the higher frequency information. And for this reason, I decided to demonstrate the optical Fourier by using fairly small patterns. So, I made transparent characters of approximately one-fourth of a millimeter in size in a non-transparent chromium mask. And just as in the previous videos, I used the home-built maskless wafer stepper to create these patterns in the chromium layer. Let me just show you the setup that I used to do the optical Fourier transforms. Now it's actually extremely simple. As a light source, I used a helium neon laser and the beam from the laser bounces off an adjustable mirror, which is basically used to control the direction of the beam. Then there is a pinhole of about 0.35 millimeters in diameter to limit the beam size a bit. And behind the pinhole is the mask that contains the different character patterns. The last part of the setup is a camera with the lens close to the pattern mask. And in this case, it's just a standard 50 millimeter lens focused at infinity. So by setting the focus of the lens to infinity, the CMOS sensor is located automatically at the Fourier plane. Now let's have a look at the optical Fourier transforms of the different characters and compare them with the calculated spectra. Here you see three images. Left the original pattern containing the letter A, the calculated Fourier transform using software in the center, and to the right the observed optical Fourier transform using the lens. Now it's actually amazing how the details in the images of theory and experiment match. Apart from a few ghost reflections that are caused by glass interfaces, they're basically identical. And here you see the same comparisons for a few other patterns, and in all cases the optical diffraction patterns exactly match the theoretical images. So this very simple optical system performs a complex mathematical operation in very high detail, and at an amazing speed. My modern Intel i5 PC takes about 2 seconds to calculate the fast Fourier transform of the original image. But the lens actually does this in the time that it takes the light to travel from the mask to the Fourier plane, which is 0.3 nanoseconds. And this puts the fast or fast Fourier transform in a somewhat different perspective, because the lens performs the task about 6 billion times faster than my computer. So how can we use this amazing speed to our advantage. Well, for example, we can use it to quickly identify patterns, and we can do this by placing an optical filter at the Fourier plane. Now let's say we want to detect the letter A in a series of patterns. So to do this, we create a filter based on the diffraction pattern of the character A. And here you see an example of such a filter pattern, where the white areas let the light pass and the black areas block the light. Now as you can see, this filter also contains an additional circular block in the center. 
And this is to remove most of the low frequencies and improve the discrimination sensitivity because most patterns still contain a relatively large amount of low spatial frequencies. So when the diffraction pattern of the letter A passes through the Fourier plane, most of the light will pass through the filter. However, if a different character passes through the image field, like for example the character B, much less light will pass the filter. So by just measuring the total amount of light after filtering, for example with a fast photodiode, you could easily detect which image contains an A. Let me show you how I attempted to do this experiment in practice. Basically I replaced the camera of the original setup with a DLP projector. So my Fourier filter is not transmissive but reflective. Only if the mirrors of the DLP projector are in the on state, they are tilted and send light in a specific off-axis direction. So if we place a particular filter pattern on the DMD chip, we create a Fourier filter that reflects light in a specific direction. And that is exactly the direction where you can place a photodiode to detect the total amount of light after filtering. Now here I placed a camera in the location of the photodiode so we can observe the filtering process in a more visual manner. The camera is connected to the PC that also controls the DMD chip. And basically the DMD chip is configured to be the second screen of this computer. And here is the filter pattern I just showed you opened in a window on the first screen. Now what I can do is slide the pattern over to the second screen of the PC which is in fact the DMD chip. And because the camera image displays what's going on on this DMD chip, we can see the pattern simultaneously appear in the micro mirror surface as we slide it over to the second screen. The Fourier transform currently projected by the lens on the DMD chip is the transform of the letter A. So we can sort of align the filter pattern with the actual Fourier signal to quickly maximize the amount of light for the letter A. Now I must admit that the alignment is far from perfect. Basically I could not set the scaling of the filter image to the correct size. Anyway, even without appropriate scaling the differences in the amount of light reflected by various characters is pretty clear. So now that the DMD is set up we can discriminate between the letter A and other characters. Using this principle, it's possible to do very fast pattern recognition. And the speed of the recognition is actually not limited by the DMD, which just displays a static reference pattern in this case. Also, it's not limited by the photodiode, because fast photodiodes can have a rise time of, let's say, 10 picoseconds. Now, the speed of the recognition process is actually only limited by the time it takes to do the Fourier transform, which is in this case executed with the speed of light and only takes 0.3 nanoseconds. Okay, that's it for this video. Hope you enjoyed it. Bye.